folks, great. I mean, John, it's great to see you here. I mean, and for everybody watching, uh, we're watching, we've got people tuned in now from over 60 countries live. So we have a great, you know, lot of interest with all these fantastic range of subjects. John and I used to work in together in exotic locations, but they're nowhere near the, the true wild places, you know, Sydney, you know, Geneva, London, places like that at these big conferences. <laughs> and as you know, we've all now replaced those big conferences with these uh, virtual meetings. But uh, if this event is anything to go by, it's a terrific success and long may it continue. So it's a real pleasure to introduce my dear friend, John Scanlon. He was the previous General Secretary of CITES, which of course is, his work was right at the front end and is right at the front line now. And he's now the Special Envoy for African Park. So here's a man of action who knows the field work, who knows how to turn all of that field work and data and experiences into smart action. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce my friend, John Scanlon. Over to you, John. Great, thanks very much, Paul, for that uh, very generous introduction. And uh, thanks, Joe, for the invitation to participate. Um, I don't normally do PowerPoint presentations, but I think we've seen a lot of talking heads over the last few months. So I thought I would spice it up a little bit with a few, uh, a few graphics and a few nice images from the field. And I don't normally wear my African parks shirt around the house, but I'm really missing the field. Uh, we've been locked down for a long time now and uh, putting this shirt on uh, reminds me what it's like in the field where it really matters at the end of the day. So let me get started. Today's International uh, Day for Biodiversity. The theme is our solutions are in nature and I, I couldn't agree more than with that theme. If we look at wildlife, let's just start talking about wildlife. There are so many threats to wildlife, whether you look at climate change, you look at pollution, habitat loss, overexploitation, and we could go on. But there's one common element to these threats. They're all about us. We are creating these threats. We are the ones that are creating these threats to wildlife. And if you look at it, there are 7.7 .7 billion or more people on the planet, but many other species are getting right down to the wire. Whether you look at elephant or rhino or lion or tiger, or so many other species are getting down to such a small number of, of animals. And if you look at this diagram here on my left, I'm not sure if it's on your left, that's a photograph I took from a helicopter above one of the parks we manage in Malawi. On the left is the park, and on the right are a lot of small farms. And this is an indication of where we are today. So many people, so much pressure on land that here we have farms right up against the park boundary with all the issues that that gives rise to. Now, it's not like the international community is not onto this. We've been working on how do we deal with the loss of wildlife or more generally the loss of biodiversity for a very long time. You can trace it back to 1972, the UN Conference on the Human Environment in Stockholm led to the creation of UN Environment Programme. A whole lot of treaties in the 1970s, including CITES. And then we had all the conventions in the 1990s, the Convention on Biological Diversity, Climate Change, Desertification. Yet despite all of this activity, we're still going backwards. Now, if you look at this slide here, something's not working. The, the WWF Living Planet Report says we've lost 60% of wildlife, wild animals, over the past 40 years. And if you look at this graph, it shows you from the 70s right through to today, from the 70s, we started with the conventions. Then we did the Convention on Biological Diversity. We had targets for 2010 and targets for 2020. Despite all of that, the graph still goes down. We're still losing all of this wildlife. We didn't meet our 2010 targets. We won't meet our 2020 targets. And then we got this in 2019, a report from the UN through the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, known as IPBES an extraordinary report has done extraordinary things globally in terms of raising awareness. Of the many findings there, they've told us 1 million species, 1 million of the 8 million species are at risk of extinction over the coming decades. But you know, very importantly, it goes on to say, if we don't change course. If we don't change course, that is what we can expect. And the status quo is not an option. It is not a business as usual scenario. We need transformative change. We need bold change. And now we're all living through 
the COVID-19 pandemic, which has had such devastating consequences on people, on economies, on societies, people losing their lives, their loved ones, their livelihoods. And what COVID-19 has reminded us in a very devastating way is the interconnected nature of things. The economy is connected to the environment, is connected to animal health and welfare. It's all interconnected. And yet, if you look at our international laws, our funds and our programs, they don't reflect that reality. We separate everything off into different silos. That has to change. And what I'd like to talk to you about today is just a couple of changes I think we need to make if we're going to save our biodiversity, our wildlife and prevent the next wildlife related pandemic. Now, in terms of COVID-19 pandemic, we still don't know the source, we're not sure. Although the most likely scenario seems that it went from a horseshoe bat to an intermediate host, possibly a pangolin through to humans. So that's not 100% agreed yet, but what is agreed is the threat that we face from wildlife related zoonotic diseases. These are diseases that jump from animals to people, they spill over. We've seen what happened with HIV AIDS, Ebola, SARS, MERS, and what has possibly happened here. And it's woken our eyes to the fact that we have to change the way we're doing things. We have to change our interrelationship with nature and with wildlife if we want to avert the next wildlife related pandemic. Now, there's a lot of attention at the moment going on what we're dealing with at the moment, that the terrible consequences of this pandemic. What I'm focusing on is looking ahead. What lessons can we learn? What are the gaps in our system? What are the flaws in our system that are going to expose us to these sorts of threats into the future? And public health officials and scientists, they've told us They've told us what sort of conditions can lead to these pandemics. And it includes the way in which we interact with wildlife, in particular wild animals, most particularly the mammals, the birds, and possibly the, the reptiles and the amphibians, and how we intrude into wild spaces, how we interfere with nature, upset habitats. We know that these sorts of conditions, if they continue, could right. lead to the next wildlife related pandemic. So we have to do something to make sure that doesn't happen. The status quo is not an option. We cannot keep doing things the way we are else we're gonna end up in exactly the same position. The IPBS report coupled with the advice we've got on zoonotic diseases, the experience of COVID-19 could be a game changer for wildlife and nature conservation. There are two aspects I wanna talk about here. One is the wildlife trade. Now here we're just focusing on wildlife in anim wildlife as animals, not animals and plants. Wildlife trade as it affects animals, in particular those that could pose a public health risk. And we have a problem with unregulated trade, with regulated trade and illegal trade. We have a problem with all three and we have to take additional measures to deal with those, those problems. And the other is how we go about protecting habitat. How do we protect our last remaining wild places so that we avoid the next wildlife related pandemic, but we also preserve our biodiversity, have these carbon sinks where we can address climate change and we can provide development opportunities. So in the time I have available, I'm going to touch on these. Let's start with illegal wildlife trade. So illegal wildlife trade, uh, we were told in 2016, affects 7,000 CITES listed species, that's animals and plants. But if we look beyond CITES listed species, we see that there's an even bigger problem. So if you look at CITES listed species, the value of that trade, illegal trade is estimated up to 23 billion. It affects these 7,000 of 36,000 CITES species. If you look at all wildlife, you add all plants, all animals, including marine, the fish, the illegal trade is worth about $200 billion a year. And this trade is depriving governments of up to $12 billion of revenue a year. And the World Bank says, if you look at the impact on ecosystems and the degradation of ecosystems through this illegal trade, it's worth one to two trillion a year. And that is basically related to the uh, 
the fact that when ecosystems become degraded, they can't absorb as much carbon. They're not as good uh, carbon sink as they could otherwise be. And nobody has attempted yet to put final figures on the economic damage, let alone the social cost and everything else of this COVID-19 pandemic or other potential future zoonotic pandemics. At the moment, what we do in terms of setting the legal framework, we rely upon a convention called CITES, which regulates international trade in around 36,000 of the 8 million species on the planet. Now, CITES has done a, a pretty good job over the years pushing the issue of illegal wildlife trade, but the convention was never designed for that. It's a conservation agreement that uses trade-related measures to make sure that animals and plants that are in trade or could be in trade are not overexploited. Sometimes the trade's prohibited, sometimes it's regulated. But the convention was never designed to deal with wildlife crime. It was used to push the issue of wildlife crime in the absence of an alternative. But the reality is, if you look at the consequences of illegal trade and wildlife crime, in terms of the loss of government revenue, in terms of the overall value of it, in terms of the impact on ecosystems, in terms of the impact on local communities who are so um, affected by this, where organized crime is benefiting from wildlife at the expense of local communities. If you put that all together, we have to acknowledge this is a serious crime. And this is a serious crime that can only be dealt with by, rain, by police and by customs and by the criminal justice system. And to make sure that happens, we have to embed dealing with illegal wildlife trade and wildlife crime into the international criminal justice system. And we can do that by creating a new agreement under the UN Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime called a protocol, as we've done with other serious crimes, such as trafficking in humans. So the first thing we need to do is we need to treat illegal wildlife trade seriously, embed it in the international criminal justice system, and make sure that we've got police customs and the justice system hot on the tail of those transnational organized criminal gangs who are depriving countries of their wildlife and local communities of all the legitimate benefits they can derive from that wildlife when they are able to exploit it in a way that suits their conditions. That's the first thing we need. We need a, a, a new wildlife crime convention to deal with this threat. The other issue is when it comes to wildlife trade, again, CITES is the instrument that regulates wildlife trade. It's a conservation agreement, but it uses trade related measures to achieve that. And what it does is it regulates wildlife trade to ensure that any trade in species that are listed under the convention, as I said, there's 36,000 there now, any trade does not lead to overexploitation of that species or threaten its survival in the wild. So the convention is about the biological aspects of trade. A species is brought under the convention if it meets trade and biological criteria. Whether or not you can or cannot trade is on the same criteria. The whole issue of what is the impact of that trade is all about overexploitation and not threatening the survival of the species in the wild. Yet the problem is that it doesn't take account of the public health implications of trade and it doesn't take account of the animal health implications of trade. So trade now can take place under CITES that could have a severe impact and pose a severe threat from a public health perspective, but it will still be approved. This is not the One Health approach. What we need to do is embed public health and animal health into wildlife trade laws to make sure that if any trade is to take place, that it takes account not just of biological sustainability, but of public health implications and animal health implications. And we also need to amend uh, wildlife trade laws to allow species to be listed to come under trade controls if they could pose a threat to public health. Now look at COVID-19. It possibly originated in a horseshoe bat. That is not under CITES. Most bats are not regulated under CITES. The intermediate host might have been a pangolin. That is listed under CITES. It's on what we call Appendix 1, so there should be no commercial trade. And yet it was there possibly as a part of this chain from bat to pangolin to people. So we need to change the way we're dealing with illegal trade and wildlife crime more generally. And we also need to deal with the unregulated trade and the regulated trade to make sure that we are building in public health, 
and animal health criteria into those wildlife trade agreements. Critically important, not happening today. The third thing I wanna talk about is that we also need to take long-term commitments to biodiverse rich places. So we've got the issue of exploitation of wildlife through, through trade, unregulated, regulated, illegal, and the need for new wildlife crime agreement, build public and animal health into wildlife trade laws. But it's much better if you can protect wildlife at its source, if you can protect that habitat. So if we can protect wildlife at source before it gets overexploited or illegally exploited or exploited in a way that poses a public health risk, it's much better to find ways and means of protecting it at its source. And the best way to do that is to make long-term commitments to biodiverse rich places. They could be found in protected areas that are in the traditional protected area system. They could be in community conservancies, private conservancies. There's a whole range of areas that have um, protection around wildlife, both formal and informal. But what we need is we need very long-term, 20, 50-year commitments to protect these places. And in doing that, we need to have as our approach, an approach that looks at people and wildlife. At the end of the day, this is all about people and our interrelationship with wildlife. And we can look at it and look at development through a conservation lens. So if we are going to look at wild places and protect them over long-term, it's also all about the people, the local people living within these places and in proximity to these places and how that interrelationship with wildlife works and how they're benefiting from this. Now, the beauty is if we can focus on wild places, protected areas, other sorts of conservancies over the long term, we can generate many benefits. There can be benefits obviously for the wildlife and biodiversity more generally but also you are securing the carbon, the, securing the carbon there, which is so important for mitigating climate change. You help with adaptation to climate change. You also, through well-managed protected areas, create conditions for wildlife tourism. So wildlife tourism has been the backbone of conservation in many places, including Africa. Now, we're facing a massive threat now with the end of tourism as a result of this, and we need to look at that. We will get through this, but it does offer opportunities for great employment generation there. So there are so many benefits. It provides security and development benefits. So if we look at long-term protected areas, investing in them, many benefits for local people and for global issues like climate change. Now I work for African Parks at the moment. Um, there are many entities within government and the non-government sector and within the other sectors that, that look at conservation, just focusing in my last five minutes on the approach of African parks. It is about a public-private partnership with governments about managing protected areas for 20 to 50 years. Government owns, sets the rules, invites African parks in and asks it to manage land on its behalf. And African parks, where the conditions are right, comes in and takes on that responsibility for management over the long term. And there are five pillars to its approach. Looks at law enforcement making sure that people know someone is looking after the area and responsible for the area. And African Parks employs around a thousand rangers across Africa in 11 countries across 17 parks, and they are 95, 98% locally recruited. And they provide security for people and wildlife. It's about wildlife conservation, bringing back the animals, restoring the land. It's about community development, engaging with the community. It's about tourism and generating local employment. It's about honey production. It's about um, exploiting the fish quite often in a number of these parks, etc. It's about generating community benefit and community opportunity and local economic growth. It's also about creating um, a platform within which we can generate support for healthcare and for education. 80,000 people got access to healthcare, 80,000 kids got access to education through interaction with our parks just last year. And it's about putting in place the management and the infrastructure. When you can do this and you get it right, it's not just us, it's others as well. You can see so many benefits to local people that flow, benefits to wildlife and benefits in terms of addressing global challenges. Now, let me share with you a few examples of uh, where I've seen this in practice. Uh, one of the great uh, opportunities I have uh, had throughout my career is the opportunity to travel extensively 
uh, across every continent uh, and most recently spend a lot of time on the African continent and enjoy the, the culture, the people, the wildlife is just extraordinary. Just three parks that I've visited to, to give you some examples. Lua Plains in Zambia, beautiful park. There are about 10,000 people who live within this park that legitimately live within this park and we manage it for and on behalf uh, of the government together with the, the wildlife agency there. It has the second largest wildebeest migration on the planet. You may not have known that. Paul, maybe you didn't even know that, but it has the second largest uh, wildebeest migration on the planet. Um, since we've been responsible for managing it, we've brought back the carnivores. Uh, the carnivores had pretty much been lost. Uh, we've brought them back there. And we have working with the private sector and philanthropy brought in tourism. And uh, we now have fantastic tourism facility there. Um, that is now the park with the tourism and the park ranges and everyone else. Um, this park is now the largest employer within the region and 95% of those people uh, who have jobs are from the surrounding area. In addition to that, um, we've helped 11,000 kids uh, get access to schooling, as well as looked at issues to do with healthcare and everything else. So wonderful story, Lua Plains, Zambia. Once we can start traveling again, this is a fantastic destination to go to. Um, fantastic tourism facility um, and fully um, um, employment there is all about employing locals through the ranges and through, through the tourism. Another park I've had the opportunity to visit, uh, Akagera National Park in Rwanda. Uh, we've been there for around 10 or 11 years. Um, after the genocide, this park was largely degraded. Um, it had lost a lot of its wildlife. Um, there was a lot of human wildlife conflict in, in certain parts of the park. Uh, we took over management at the request of the government of Rwanda in partnership with the Rwanda Development Board. Now let's fast forward 10 years. Uh, there are now um, all of the big five are back. The big five African animals are all back there. Uh, tourism has been reintroduced. There are now three fantastic tourism facilities that are there. Uh, last year, we had close to 50,000 tourists come to the park, half Rwandan, half international. There are local tourist guides there that guide people through the park. And the park is now generating, or it was before we had this pandemic, around 90% of its own operating cost through tourism. It's also generated a lot of local enterprise. Uh, it is allowed after a lot of work, local people to fish from the lake. Uh, it is um, uh, stimulated through certain investment, uh, honey production. They even brought together local people to create a cooperative to bring their chickens together so that they could start producing eggs for the rangers and the tourists. Fantastic place, the interaction with the community and the deep engagement, the local enterprise, uh, the return of wildlife, the tourism is awesome. Another site not to be missed once we're allowed to travel again. And in my last couple of minutes, Garamba National Park in Demo Democratic Republic of Congo, an extraordinary park that has a long history, had a troubled history with the um, Lord's Resistance Army being very active in the region, uh, causing all sorts of mayhem for local people and, uh, and the poaching and smuggling of wildlife. If we look to today and what is happening today, there are around 525 people employed there, 95% are um, from the DRC, 74% uh, from a local community. It's the largest employer in that region. Um, we have provided great support to local schools. We provided access to healthcare to 25,000 people last year through our health clinics, and we provide water to 24 villages and 7,000 people. In addition to that, the, the Cordofan giraffe, very endangered, the numbers are up, and we've gone from around 100 elephant poached a year down to about two to four a year as a result of fantastic work. And we're now exploring uh, putting a tourism facility in there for the first time uh, where you can fly directly from Entebbe in Uganda into the park and explore this wonderful place. Again, when we get the opportunity, a place to go once tourism opens up. Fantastic success, three fantastic success stories of turning around places, looking after them, securing them with benefits for people, for wildlife, generating local enterprise and local opportunity. So I know I'm supposed to stop in about a minute and Paul might have some questions, but just to conclude, um, 
if we are going to avoid the next wildlife related pandemic, if we are going to stop this massive loss of biodiversity, if we are going to deal with climate change, we're going to have to make fundamental shifts to the system. In terms of wildlife and wildlife trade, it means in my view, we need to get a dedicated agreement on wildlife crime, as I've described. We need to fundamentally change wildlife trade laws to embed directly into them human health or public health and animal health into the decision-making processes in so many ways. And thirdly, we need to really commit over the long term to biodiverse rich places, 20, 30, 50 years, invest in them, generate local benefit. Then we're gonna be well-placed on all these global challenges. So our solutions are in nature. The big question for me is, will 2020 be the year we start to recalibrate our relationship with nature? It could be, but it's gonna take effort. It's not going to happen by itself. All of us, everyone from the 60 countries online, all of this broader community, we have to be strong advocates for change. We cannot allow the status quo to prevail. We are going to have to change the system to reflect the scale and nature of the challenges. That means fundamental shifts in laws, in funds, in programs, and how we approach nature conservation. With that, Thank you very much, Paul, and may I wish you all a happy International Day for Biological Diversity. Wow, great. John, thank you so much indeed. Hang on a second. Well, John, thank you so much, sir. I mean, your, your wrap up couldn't have been better because we've got a lot of questions here. And, and I had this first one is that we've never seen such a, a sweet spot. We're in the headlines. Even, even the, news, you know, the newspapers, all the press, not just the environmental green press, you know, our great you know, conservation actors, we've got all the mainstream press pushing for the fact that we need to redress the balance with nature. And all the words that I hear you and all of our science colleagues using seem to be repeated verbatim in the press, which is a beautiful experience. It's something we would have dreamed of six months ago. <laughs> you know, this business of we, you know, we're in this position because we've got a, an out of balance relationship with nature. We need to preserve what we've got. We need to restore what's damaged and reset our values to stop it happening. Again, I'm seeing that in the mainstream press and I'm, I'm only having to stop myself short from opening up a bottle of champagne and celebrating. So how do we actually make the very best use of this moment? I know this is what you were saying at the end, but you know, this moment in time, we just can't afford to let it whiz past us because we'll be kicking ourselves for, for generations. Um, and yet there are some real problems, aren't there? Because we see the long-term benefit. Everybody watching sees the long-term benefits, blind in the obvious. But at the same time, we've got a lot of actors who have big interests in providing a sense of urgency to the people that are struggling. And that sense of urgency works against us. It's about removing environmental controls and human rights controls to kind of try and jumpstart the economy. And they do have the edge on us because people who are bumping along the bottom and are desperately struggling during these times will listen to that and say, hey, I just need my job back. So how do we create that similar sense of urgency that we have, that all of us watching have, and generate that out, amplify it, so that we make the right decision on this very critical part. Thanks, Paul. Well said. And the, the first thing I'd say is put the champagne on ice, don't pop the cork, because there's a lot of talk and a lot of recognition, but that doesn't mean anything unless we institutionalise changes. If we come out of the end of this and we have all the same laws, funds, programmes, the same institutional approaches, we're going to end up in exactly the same position or worse in the not too distant future. So we really have to keep the heat on. It's not enough just to talk something up or to make a few domestic changes. We need to fundamentally shift the system. The IPBS report talked of transformational change. And COVID-19 pandemic has further reinforced the fact the status quo is not on. So at the end of the day, these systemic and institutional changes have to come from countries countries have to agree to put in place this. So we need to work with them and demonstrate, as I'm sure we can, the benefits. The investment you need in nature conservation, in how you regulate wildlife trade, 
is an absolute fraction of the amount invested in public health, in development, in security. Yet nature conservation and the way we regulate wildlife trade has massive benefits for public health, for development and security. So we need to make the case in relation to the issues that are of critical importance to governments. How do we ensure development? How do we ensure jobs? How do we stop the next pandemic? And some very keen on how do we deal with climate change? We can, through nature, offer multiple benefits through one channel of investment. So we have to make the case, not to ourselves, because we're all persuaded. We have to make the case to those who are not yet on board. And we can do it. We have the right arguments, but everyone has to persist. We cannot let anyone off the hook here. Push, 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 keep going, persist. Fantastic, John, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and what do you think, is it to get investments right and to make it attractive for people that are buying insurances and mortgages and uh, putting money aside for pensions and, and for big businesses who are looking to invest, what's the right way to make investment in nature profitable quickly? so that we can then celebrate success. And you're right, I'll keep that, that cork in the champagne, but so we can say, look, you've all made the right decisions. We've all been through a bumpy time. One thing I would love to see, and I, I know we'll never get it, but, but of course we can share some champagne when it happens, is I happened to see yesterday's news where in the US, um, the, 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 the biggest funds and the wealthiest people so far in COVID have made $433, $434 billion. And it really made me jump when I realized that the, the you know, volatile stock market and the prices of oil and all these things naturally are huge opportunities for people in the know who know how to work those markets. And I just am so disappointed that there isn't an international ethical law, for the want of a better term, that means that if you make a few hundred billion dollars on uh, a disaster that comes from biodiversity and our relationship with it, that you're not um, forced, as it were, to pay something back to support it. Because the numbers are staggering, John. I, I don't pretend to be an economist, but you can't avoid the numbers. If they say that the COVID so far has cost something in the region of about nine trillion over two years. Mm. And the estimated cost to protect 30% of a planet is about 100 billion a year. So, um, you know, that's a blooming good investment. To save three trillion, you, you invest 100 billion a year. So the numbers just seem so blindingly obvious. And I'm tempted between let's make it quickly profitable so it happens and we can celebrate success. And let's also, another impossible task, how can we make it quickly illegal, let alone unethical, to make all this money when biodiversity goes wrong? Yeah, look, it's a challenge. I think we do have to look at what we define as a return on investment as well. So, you know, it is a very good investment to invest in nature, to invest in how we deal with wildlife trade, to invest in how we rela relate to wildlife more generally. The return is that you don't have zoonotic pandemics. The return is you can deal with climate change and you can avoid the worst consequences of climate change. The benefits are you can generate jobs, in particular for people in remote communities. Um, we need the investment. Uh, the money is there, and I think if we make the right case, we'll see the money flow, but we, we all need to persist with this. Exactly. Thanks, John. I've, Thanks, sorry, Paul. we've got a lot of questions for you, and I'm not, not remotely surprised. If you can hang on a bit longer, um, I'll read this one. Um, thank you, Natasha, wherever you're from. It doesn't actually tell me what country you're from, but you're from one of our 60 countries. Natasha says, wildlife crime has moved online. And CITES seems to have no way of monitoring these online transactions. So it's a very practical question there. And uh, John Scanlon, what should we be doing? So let's remember CITES sets international rules about wildlife trade. So what species are regulated and how they're regulated. When it comes to combating wildlife crime, we really need to turn to the expertise of organizations like World Customs Organization, the UN Office of Drugs and Crime and Interpol because fighting transnational organized crime is about getting those professionals involved who know how to fight transnational organized crime. And that is the police, the customs and, and others. So really here, I think if we're gonna tackle it, we need to embed it and make sure police 
and, and other enforcement officials are treating wildlife crime as a serious crime, deserving their time, deserving their attention, and using all the tools they have to crack this open. Because online crime is not just about wildlife. And they have many tools and techniques for cracking it. So they're who we need on board here. Convention can set some rules, but we need them on board, the, 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 the enforcement professionals to crack this one. Fantastic. Uh, uh, interestingly enough, in a few weeks, I'm, I'm presenting a talk at the UK Environmental Law Association. And as you can well imagine, I've got some pretty tough questions for them. They're great people, but uh, I think a lot is uh, coming their way. And John, if you can hang on, I've got a, a, another question. Um, should a new organization be set up to deal with wildlife crime? If not, how can governments be convinced of the importance of regulating wildlife trade? And, and for me, I'd say, I'd say put, put, put someone called John Scanlon in front of them for five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Paul. So we've got a couple of things there. We've got the, the wildlife crime side. So, you know, I think we need to embed it institutionally into the criminal justice system through a, a new agreement under UN Convention Against Transnational Organised Crime. In the meantime, though, we need to crank up the enforcement effort and we can work through an organisation or it's a partnership called the International Consortium on Combating Wildlife Crime. It is CITES, Interpol, UN Office of Drugs and Crime, World Bank and World Customs. So we need to continue to use that to, to push the immediate issues and persuade countries at a country level to scale up their enforcement effort, which we are seeing in a number of countries, and to scale up their cooperative effort, because this is cross-border, it needs cross-border cooperation. On the legal, on the unregulated and regulated trade, we need a fundamental shift in thinking there. It's not just about biological sustainability, it's about public and animal health, and I could add, you know, the issue of um, um, invasive species, species becoming uh, invasive. We have to get out of this little silo that, you know, we'll only look at this bit and we won't worry about these other bits. The world doesn't work that way. Nature doesn't work that way. So we need a one health approach. The biological aspects, the health aspects and the animal health aspects all need to be brought together. Then you take a decision on whether that trade ought to be allowed or not. That's a fundamental shift that has to be made. I love that one, one health approach, John. I'm learning a lot today. Is you always remember these lovely things, one health approach. I was with the IUCN discussion today on, on this very subject. And um, one of the things that came up there, uh, uh, the great Michael, he said, um, we, we, um, we need to build, uh, we, need to, we need to invest in people and mangroves and not cement. <laughs> <laughs> I agree, I wasn't there, but I agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I do have to thank you. Thanks for the list of examples of the parks that you manage and the regions that you manage so well. But I'll, as, we're, as we're live to a large group of people across at least 60 nations, I do want to thank you for your work in Bazaruto, Mozambique. Mm. It's a region that means a lot to us at Pristine mm. Seas. And uh, we had a terrific expedition there. And it was a, a beautiful um, follow on, although we didn't foresee at the time that you um, would move some of your uh, great efforts into Bazaruto. I don't know it's going really well. Do you want to say anything about Bazaruto, John? <laughs> Yeah, Paul, you know, I had a slide on Bazaruto, but I thought I didn't have enough time to, to tackle it. I've also been to Bazaruto. What a fantastic marine park. Beautiful, dugong there. Um, we've got fantastic tourism facility there as well. A lot of local people live within and amongst the park. Um, fantastic. It's about marine and terrestrial uh, wildlife and biodiversity. Thanks for raising Bazaruto in Mozambique. Beautiful place. Once again, once we're allowed to get up and about again, fantastic place to go you won't be disappointed super good john thanks very much indeed john this was a this was an excellent talk i took a bit more of your time because i was just busting to for everybody to benefit from your experiences as i always have done so thanks again john i'll see you soon for some celebratory champagne mate thank you paul great to see you again look forward to seeing you soon cheers super. thank you buddy